Because if we're not, if we're emphasizing the exact opposite during our warm up, all of a sudden you think they're gonna, athletes are going to turn a switch during our, our lifting session or on field session or speed sessions or our practices. They're also going to turn a switch and become now this adaptable, creative, abundant mover. When in a warm up, we just we just stripped away all that kind of stuff. And so I think that's why I think the warm up is a really extremely important thing for our athletes because it I think it sets a tone and dictates everything moving forward um, from that point. And so if it's going to be the exact opposite of what you're preaching to your athletes, then I think you're, you're again, you're causing more harm than, than you are good. That was Michael Zwiefel, and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by our longtime sponsor, simplyfaster.com. There's two items I'd like to talk to you about today that you can find in Simply Faster's online store. Uh, whether you're a coach or an athlete, these are both things that you'll find highly useful as tools in your training toolbox. The first is blood flow restriction training methods. And after hearing about blood flow restriction training for years now, as well as the results that athletes are getting with it, especially in, for example, uh, lactate sports like swimming, uh, 100 meter freestyle. I And not only hearing of that, but also seeing how much some swimmers had liked that type of training method, I knew I had to start trying it out myself. So uh, I've been utilizing the air bands. I really enjoy it, both the uh, the feeling of training of while I'm actually training with them, as well as seeing the visual result of spending time training with the methods and then the strength result. Uh, they've been a really cool training tool, and I would definitely recommend checking into air bands. Uh, SimplyFaster.com also has B Strong brand blood flow restriction. The second item is the VMAX Pro, and this is a new option for velocity based training. Barbell tracking, it provides valuable load-based data, including speed in all phases of a lift, and it delivers key metrics such as power, velocity, distance, as well as duration of effort. The VMAX Pro system measures any lift you can think of. It's portable, durable, and intuitive. You can check out these two items and much more at our sponsor, simplyfaster.com's online store. Let's get on to the show. As I've grown as a coach, it's been really enjoyable to experience sport and movement in different ways. One of my experiences has been working in a college weight room, and in that time, it was very interesting to pay attention not only in the athletes I was working with, but also in some of the other groups that were in the weight room, the defining characteristics of some of the best athletes. And although oftentimes these athletes were very fast or strong, they weren't always the strongest or the fastest. But much more definitively, these athletes could move and react incredibly well in the context of their sport, and they loved to play. With play, movement, and exploration at the core of athleticism and sport, it's interesting that the culture of the gym, and so often in sport itself, is completely the opposite. So much of modern sport acts like athletes are robots, a culture based off lines and whistles and a perception of needing to do everything in one particular way. This topic is really important, and it's really exciting to bring back guest Michael Zwiefel to the show. Michael is the owner and head of sports performance for Building Better Athletes, a performance center in Dubuque, Iowa. Michael has been a frequent guest on this podcast, speaking on topics of perception, reaction, exploration in the weight room, creativity, and much more. Michael is also a team member of the movement education group Emergence and has written a ton of articles for Just Fly Sports in the past on all sorts of topics dealing with reactive agility, perception, reaction, creative movement, and he has been a huge influence on me on all things movement with athletes. On today's show, Michael is going to go on a deep dive on how his warm-ups fit with the key characteristics of athleticism. Michael will talk on how he connects his warm-up to core human instincts and uh, desire for evolution and leveling up. He talks about how to develop a love for movement and play that actually transcends organized sport play. Michael and I also take on a broad scope discussion on the overstructuring that is so rampant in sport and probably in our culture in general. This was a really fun and important show in light of our modern sport culture. One last thing before we get started is that I wanted to let you know my online course, Elastic Essentials, is launching the date of this podcast release, Thursday, October 14th, and will release for eight days until October 22nd. This course is the result of my evolution as a coach over the last 15 years. It'll teach you my approach to blending force production with free energy return. You can learn more about the course by heading on over to JustFlySports.com or check out the links on my Instagram profile. So with that said, let's get on to the show, episode 276 with coach Michael Zwiefel. Michael, it's awesome to have you back, man. Um, Although not completely related to warmups, I was interested to ask you 
about tra- your thoughts on trail running, uh, just like getting out on trails or, or do some athletes maybe doing perhaps longer runs and not just all doing sprint work. But what are your thoughts on getting out in nature and doing trail runs every now and then for speed power athletes? Yeah, I uh, obviously we're just talking about that, Joel, off, off the mic here. But yeah, I, I'm actually a fan of it. And obviously, it depends on if athletes like that and enjoy that. Um, I think there's a, a lot of benefits to getting out a in nature and then obviously getting out onto like a trail that has uneven paths and different slopes, you know, uphill, downhill. Uh, I think we've been fear mongering our athletes, our speed power athletes, that if you go out for a mile run, you're all of a sudden going to turn into a slow twitch monster. And that is just so far from the truth that I think we should actually be encouraging some of our athletes, especially that maybe like to do some uh, um, steady state aerobic training, mile to mile, one or two days a week is not going to turn your sprinters into, you know, like I said, slow, slow twitch monsters. And it's funny because I, I, you know, college coaches get after this, you know, they, you know, one of their athletes goes for a little mile run and they just yell at them. Like, like, first of all, there's been many benefits to that aerobic capacity, aerobic base. And then if they're going out in like in, in the nature and they're going out and doing these things, like you're replacing all your extensive tempos by these trail runs. Like there's nothing better than that. And I've ran two marathons and I was, you know, you know, getting a lot more miles than just, you know, two to four miles a week. And I always felt my feet, my ankles, my lower leg felt, you know, just much more robust. I felt very elastic. Um, and I didn't lose like my vertical jump and I didn't lose my, my, you know, sprinting speed. And this is despite training for a marathon. So I think there's benefits to it. And another, you know, I, I, you know, put a challenge to, to all these college coaches, you know, you look at most college track and field teams, like grab those 800 runners. They're probably getting out. What do you think, Joe? 15 to 25 miles a week. Most 800 runners. Yeah. So 800 could be a big, big range, but that's probably the average. Yeah. Yeah. Big, yeah. You're probably getting anywhere from 10 to 25 miles a week. Those, those athletes, those athletes will get out on your, on your football team and will dust 95% of your athletes, like in a flying 10 or 40 yard dash. Yep. Those guys can still boogie like, and they're getting in a lot of miles per week. So like we have to get out this mindset that going out for some, some steady state runs is also going to turn all of our athletes, whether it be football players, basketball players, you're tracking field spinners. It's just going to turn them into just mush and, and slow twitch athletes. And it's just, just in, it can't be farther from the truth. Um, so I, you know, if our athletes, if athletes do like to get out and do some steady state running, and especially if it's out in nature. And for me, I always found it like meditative. I, I just, I, you know, got my thoughts. I, I just enjoy doing that. I think if our athletes enjoy doing that, we shouldn't be dissuading them from, you know, doing that once or twice a week. I think it'd be, there's more benefits than there is potential negative uh, you know, outcomes. Yeah. I think in a lot of cases, if, if there's not like a coach who's really pushing them hard to athletes will self-select a pace that is not going to, oh, we've talked about on this podcast before with Evan uh, Pycon was like the idea of, you know, you're compressing, you're occluding, whatever, like it's, someone might be able to handle a lot more, someone less, but I would imagine if you just said, Hey, go for a couple mile run, that occluder, that compressive athlete's probably going to run a lot slower than the, the gazelle bounding on, you know, and just like you said it, like being in nature versus a flat road is, I just feel like there's a world of difference. Like it's, it's, I feel like unless you've gone and done it, like trained with a lot on a lot of like rocky, rugged trails versus running on the road. I, I know for me back when I was, um, the year when I was 21 and I, ju- I jumped seven feet for the first time. Well, the only time, <laughs> um, but I, uh, that year I did a lot of like every weekend, not every weekend, but often if I just felt I needed to recover, I just go run a couple miles out in the trails, like, and you know, the trails near the school I was at. And I just felt that was so helpful for recovery or even like between bigger training periods, the end of summer, um, between indoor and outdoor, just doing some trail running, maybe like, you know, running about 10, 15 miles on the week. That was good for me. Like I always felt that was rejuvenating and it's interesting. It is almost like a, could be a trade off at some point, right? It's almost, um, like you said, you were doing marathon training and the elasticity was going up because you're training all those run tissues. But then, yeah, this is just that give and take of if that does start yeah. to impede uh, power and whatnot. But yeah, I totally yeah, agree with yeah. But yeah, like I said, I just, you know, an athlete getting three to six miles a week isn't going to all of a sudden, you know, change their whole muscle physiology, you know, and I, I, I for just practice examples, I've, I had a you know state champion girl, 100 meter, 100 and 200 meter state champion. That was, you know, 11 nineties. And, you know, I think she ran 23, nine and, and she ran cross country in the fall. And mm-hmm. it was like, she, why did she do it? She, Cause she enjoyed it. So there there's, you know, there's mental, emotional and social aspects too, to getting out and doing those things much more than just physical. So I think we just, these, these, uh, blanket statements that, you know, you know, that, you know, time, your time, your team in the mile and whoever gets first place, cut them from the team. Cause they're probably the worst athlete. Like what? <laughs> these things are just absurd statements. Like, 
there, there's benefits to doing some some of those things, you know, every once in a while. Again, like you said, Joe, I don't want them pounding on concrete for, you know, five, six mile runs, but I'm going to go out for a hike or a little, you know, just, you know, uh, run out in, in nature or on a trail. Uh, there, there's benefits to that that isn't going to all of a sudden just change who our athletes are um, and just drastically make them, you know, slow twitch. Yeah, I agree. I, I like um, a, a quote that was said a long time ago on this podcast was, Angus Ross and basically it was the idea that I think we were talking in regards to like something Franz Bosch just said with muscle slack and doing deep squats instead of half squats but Angus said the body isn't dumb like <laughs> I mean we're we're more robust than we think we are and again if I'm training a power athlete I'm not going to be sending him for two longer runs or or I mean to be honest I I do a lot of like easy extensive tempo on different surfaces with different styles and those kind of things but I don't I think we're we're not quite as fragile in that respect as I think it's it's easy to make it seem that we are. And a lot of that, like you said, is mental. Like I remember when I was coaching track full time in Division Three, I was really like resistant to anyone. Even if you're uh, four hundred, even eight hundred, almost, but really definitely four hundred on down. I was the thought of them doing cross country in the fall. I was like, oh. But then I actually saw it happen a few times, and I was like, eh, it wasn't that bad. Like <laughs> it wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be. As long as they're they're still doing some power stuff, you know, those fast twitch muscles that come around, like. I, it's one of those things I have to observe and actually see and, and not be quite as much of a curmudgeon. There's always a balance to things. Yeah. And that, that point that we're, we'll get into more is that, yeah, we're, we're the human, all humans are very adaptive species. We're very, you know, uh, uh, you know, adapting to a lot of different things. We, we're not just going to just, you know, turn the mush because we get some sort of stimulus. And so, and that's actually, there's some good literature out there showing that we don't actually know how our, all our athletes will respond to a, you know, certain stimulus. There's such wide bandwidth of how people respond to the same stimulus that, you know, you think that, you know, just because you're going up for two mile run, all of a sudden, like you said, your whole muscle physiology just, just switches. But we, that's not true. And, and we, we actually don't even know we can, we can apply things to our athletes and we still don't even know what kind of adaptation they're going to get from those things. So uh, yeah, the, the human species is a very adaptive um, species. And, and I think we have to give us, you know, all of us a little bit more credit that we're not going to also just, you know, morph into a totally different you know a person because of you know doing something once or twice a week for you know one or two miles yeah yeah there is a certainly a bandwidth i think about a couple of stories too I, one was when i was coaching on the uh, track on the d3 level i had a high jumper who i think it was in the span of maybe three or four weeks he had gone from jumping like six feet seven to six nine and a half and was doing really well and he unbeknownst to me he told me at that point he's like yeah i've just been doing a little bit of running too i like running like just go out and running you know two or three miles a few times a week and probably in the trails i had no idea it's funny i'm glad he told me that after because if he would have told me it before i'd be like, ah, like i don't know about that so yeah. um, but i also remember one time i was in my mid-20s and i i want to say it was in the summer or an off season ish period and i was running a more distance and on not really on trails just like regular shoes on roads and probably doing about, I don't know, 20 miles a week. And my legs were bricks, man. Like my vertical went down like six inches. It was awful. But I think if I would have done that in minimal shoes in a dynamic environment and threw some more intervals in there, it would have been a totally different story. So for me personally, that there's the balance. Like for me, trail run a few times a week, especially in minimal shoes. Awesome. Amazing. Roads, just get that mileage up there a little bit and that's going to trash me. I, you know, So yeah, yep. it's a little bit, yeah, like I said, different stimulus for everybody. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, cool. All right. So I, I want to talk to you today or ask you about uh, warm ups. And I've had a few podcasts talking about just like games and activities. And obviously, a lot of times this fits into the warm up sequence. So uh, maybe I'll start with a few macro questions. And the first macro, and I think the answer might be kind of obvious, but um, just in the last decade, like the biggest changes to how you've seen warm ups, and then we'll zoom in a little bit. Oh, yeah. So I guess if you talk about from when I started to now, I, I, I'm you know, come from more of a classical, I guess, strength conditioning side too. I played college football, you know, studied exercise science and whatnot. So, you know, I definitely came from that, that school of dynamic warm up lines on the whistle, you know, kind of the same thing day in and day out. Um, and probably what, you know, transitioned my change was honestly being in the, in the private sector. Um, where, where you're in the private sector is, you know, every, each and every day, I got to kind of win my athletes over. Otherwise, they could leave. And there goes, you know, obviously money or business. What were, while I was in the college sector and I worked for college and played, like my athletes are going to be back the next day, no matter what I do to them. Like they, they have to be back because they're in the college athlete, they're a college athlete and have to be back because of the team. So in the private sector, like each and every day, you're trying to win over your athletes. You know, you got to keep them engaged. 
I mean, you got to make sure that they're having fun. You got to connect with them. So if I did the same monotonous warm ups day in and day out within the private sector, I would definitely lose some of my athletes. Um, and so it started with that where I realized that as I kind of just, you know, stood back and watched the body language of my athletes, that some of these classical dynamic warm ups just, you know, they weren't engaging. And so, uh, um, and the warm ups we have to understand goes a lot deeper than just the physical. You know, it's not hard to get somebody, you know, their body temp- temperature you know, increased, you know, put them in a sauna, get them on a bike, their body temperature will increase. So we have to understand that warms go a lot more, a lot deeper than just physically, but socially, mentally, emotionally, psychologically. And so when I kind of peeled back the layers and just look, looked at what I was doing with my athletes, like I, I got to move away from the, this monotonous mundane warm up day in and day out. And instead I have to do things that are engaging to my athletes that engage them mentally, socially, engage them. They just went through seven hours of day of school. I have to get them out of that, um, just that monotonous environment that they come from school. And I have to get them involved, give them some uh, autonomy and ownership over this, this process. So, because it just, you have to shift their mindset when they come in. So that's probably where it started. Joel was probably being in the private sector was a big uh, eye opener because I just couldn't do the same things that I was, you know, I did or was doing in the, in the public sector. Yeah. Now, if you went back to um, like the university sector where the athletes they're with you, no matter what. Right. And, like, I imagine that everything you've changed and done that you would keep with you, or if you went back, or if there's people who are in the university sector listening, how would, what would you, would you do everything you're doing now that we'll be getting into, or how would that change, or what things would you keep with you going back into that uh, environment? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Joel. Um, and I still work with a couple of college teams, but I, so the, what's nice is that um, the college teams that I work with come to my facility, so I have access to my my flooring, my equipment, et cetera. So I, I basically keep all the same things. Um, part of the reason that I'm kind of dissuaded from getting, ever getting back into the college sector, um, like full time like that would be because I, I think it'd be hard to win over sport coaches with some of the things that we, we do where, where you're kind of uh, at the mercy of the sport coach. And I don't know if they, you know, really, you know, it obviously be, be, you know, depend on some conversation we'd have with them, but it'd be hard for some sport coaches to, you know, see some of the things that I'm doing with my athletes and then see that done in the college sector. And so I don't know if I'm just, you know, cut out or, you know, would be cut out for that college sectors. Um, but if I would and had full autonomy, yeah, absolutely. I would be doing many of the same things that I'm doing. I would, you know, now, uh, I mean, that if you think about the classical dynamic warm up, like we basically never do anything like that anymore. So there's no, no lines where we're, you know, getting athletes in and doing kind of these organized uh, um, classical type warm ups. And so, I wouldn't do that either at the college setting. I think there there's so much more opportunity um, to engage our athletes in a much more a deep level than just physically getting them going through some movement patterns and getting their body temperature increased and slowly progressing through deeper ranges of motion. I think there's so much more that the work can accomplish than just just those things. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're tackling warm up from a from a perceptual standpoint. We're tackling warm from an emotional and social standpoint. We're tackling a warm from a technical tactical st- standpoint. So, all those things I think can be uh, touched upon in your warm up when you're doing it in you know in a uh, much more alive and dynamic mm-hmm. uh, setting than than what you classically see from you know college teams. I think it would be a really valuable practice for coaches to attempt, or if there was criteria you could list, to only look at your warm up sometimes from a mental, emotional, psychological perspective, like to to look for those markers to know what they are, and that's all you care about for that warm up. And I think that so often, and you mentioned like college coaches who wouldn't agree with that style of things that in my experience it is coaches who are more like just grind it's about the grind like they have a really hard time with that and i found for me um the men's tennis program that i worked with back at cal was a good that was a great um just how i transitioned in a similar way came in first year i'm gonna be a hard ass you know and like oh those players that said the longest look on their face as i'm running them through this very military style dynamic warm-up and then as the years passed and you know the relationship with the coaches grew like we just put more games in and more games and eventually we're playing 30 minutes of basketball before we lift. And it's like awesome. You get like the coaches playing sometimes and those kids are, I mean, and those, as we transitioned to, as we moved forward in time over my eight years working with that group, like our injuries were going down. Athletes were having, like, it was just fun. Like it, it was, uh, there were so many good things that were happening and we didn't, we didn't lose like performance outputs or anything. You were, and in fact, they were anything but going up. And it was just a great situation. But if you have coaches that 
are, I mean, and tennis, I think is rare that you're going to have, I mean, I think the average tennis coach is not the grinder mentality. It's a little bit more free flowing sport, a little more, a little more country club vibes. There's other sports that are way more and a lot harder to break through there. But I, I totally hear you with that. Like the, that can be difficult. It's almost like you have to find, maybe there's a spectrum, right? Like ways you can scientifically validate a little bit of games. <laughs> you have to scientifically validate it if you're going to sneak it in, in that situation. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. And, uh, I mean, which is interesting because the, 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 the literature and science on like small sided games is, is pretty abundant right now and pretty, you know, pretty strong and showing the benefits to just technical tackle changes, you know, in sports. So finding ways to maybe scale back those, the, the complexity, um, scale back the size and the speed of those things can be definitely applied to a warm setting. And you're going to get many of those benefits that you just talked about, but I can tell you this, like it was a hard transition. I, I you know, I think it's pretty easy for coaches to have one or two dynamic warmups, you know, you know, warm up a warm up B and just have their athletes flow through it. I mean, again, five years of college football, you know, I did the same warm for five years straight, <laughs> you know, it was, it's easy for a coach, especially if they have multiple teams to just throw out a warm up and have those athletes get, you know, memorize that warm up and just do it day in and day out. It makes their job easier. So the, the transition to tra- uh, transform, forming my warm ups has definitely been hard. Cause like every day when I go in, it's, it's more about reading the room, asking questions, giving the, the group and certain athletes uh, autonomy and ownership. So the warm up is kind of alive. It, it's, 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 it's adapting. But depending on our groups and who's here, depending on how many athletes are here, the sports that they play. Um, so it's, it's harder from a coaching standpoint because every day you go in with a little bit of like, uh, you know, of a, a plan, but then 50% of that plan is kind of just like, I'm just, I'm just going to let it free flow and see what happens with our athletes. And so it is a little bit harder for those control freak coaches that just want everything structured, you know, certain reps, distance, you know, uh, things like that, where it is every day I'm, you know, adapting how we're warming up, the length of the warm-up, what type of activities that we're doing, depending on the body language that I see from my athletes, depending on the, the age of my athletes, the type of athletes that I have in. Um, and so it is diff- more difficult because you're not quite as in control as you would with a normal dynamic warm-up. So I, and that part can be challenging for many coaches, but I think when you let go and you, you, you start to be um, kind of in a passenger with the athletes rather than just being the driver and they're in the back seat and you're telling them exactly what to do. And instead of you being involved with the athletes and it's, it's a, you know, you guys are working together in this process. It becomes a, I think a much more fulfilling uh, period of your training or your practice. I think a, a question a lot of coaches would have is you're, you have the spectrum, right? You have basically what you're doing uh, very progressive on, on one end, so to speak. And then you have um, like the very rigid, like, um, very rigid, the same warm up every time on the other. And I think the, the, what the reason the person on the other side would probably say would be, well, we want routine. Maybe we want like a Pavlovian dog response, right? Like you're going through this routine to get ready. Uh, so I'm just curious what you would say to that. Cause I think as you move throughout that spectrum from one to the other, and I would say too, before I you answer that, I, I don't know that there's anyone who's further on the spectrum than you. Cause that'd just be complete mess chaos, right? Just roll out a ball and say, right. <laughs> I don't know. Um, anyways, just your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, uh, there, there may be some valid, you know, um, points to that. So as I thought about, you know, as I changed that, my warm up. so obviously like you said, you know, coaches want some routine, right? So, um, you want a, a routine warm up that allows your athletes to maybe become comfortable with that warm up. That way, when they get into competition, um, they can always kind of revert back to that, that warm up, and they feel comfortable with that. And so it may decrease arousal or, or sensations of pressure and stress because they have this this routine they can fall back upon i I can understand that a little bit although as an athlete i never really felt like that was a um a big piece of success or you know big piece of reason to do a monotonous warm day in and day out you know i would argue two things a um in our warm-ups like i said i give my athletes a lot of autonomy and ownership over certain time frames or periods of our warm-up and so I think that accomplishes kind of that, that part of getting a routine. So whatever our athletes kind of like, and they kind of sit, like talking about earlier, Joe, self-select, they can, they have opportunities to self-select things that they feel best fits them or feel they feel best gets them prepared. So there's periods where they have a time and ownership um, to choose certain modalities or certain movements or certain, they, they have some freedom to have those periods where they can go off and do their own thing. So I think that accomplishes that, that kind of routine or that them being comfortable, with some of the things that we're doing. And secondly, I just, I, you know, as much as we may want our athletes to get in routine, I, I think that isn't a really uh, great reason to, to 
do the same thing day in and day out. When you talk about Joe, when we can be doing things that allow for a much more robust, adaptive, creative response from our athletes. You talk about your, you saw injury levels go down. You talked about, you saw kind of your athletes movement signatures or movement solutions expand because of that warm up. So what are we, if I value my athletes being adaptable and I value my athletes being creative and, and having abundance in how they're moving solutions, how is doing the same warm up day in and day out building that capacity? Mm-hmm. It's not, it's restricting it. And so as much as that routine in maybe certain, certain situations may help our athletes, I think in the, the grand scheme of things, it, it hurts our athletes. It hurts their creativity. It hurts their abundance and adaptability. And it, it makes, it, it sets the tone for all of our training sessions that this is prescriptive. I am telling you, I'm dictating exactly what you do when I don't want that for my athletes. I mean, that's each in the, to each coach's own um, philosophy, but I want athletes to make decisions. I want my athletes to be, uh, um, have abundance and, and adaptability in how they solve movement problems. And if I don't do that, the first thing they walk into my door, the first period of our training session, I'm not actually um, allowing my athletes to do those things. And how I actually, uh, you know, fulfilling my philosophy as a coach, if I'm not doing that first and for, foremost. So if it's important and those things are important to me, I think those are the most important things for me as a coach. I want athletes to have ownership. I want them to be their own decision makers. I want them to have some introspection of their body and do what they feel is best for them. I want them to be creative and adaptable. If those things are important to me and those are the most important things to me as a coach, then I goddamn well, I'm going to do that first and foremost in my training sessions. If I'm not doing that, then I'm not really fulfilling how I, my philosophy as a coach. I wanted to take a break from the show and briefly share with you the difference that performance herbalism can make for you. Several years ago, I had Logan Christopher, CEO of Lost Empire Herbs, on the show to talk about uh, hypnosis and mental training for athletes. Uh, While talking to him, I realized he also had an herbalism company. So shortly thereafter, I used the Phoenix Formula, which was my first product I bought from them. I had great results with it, not only increasing my energy and decreasing my need for coffee and caffeine, But I also noticed that it was making an impact on my lifts and my weight room numbers. I was having a great training experience. Shortly thereafter, I also got into the shiliagit resin as well as other herbs. And I don't look at supplementation the same way. I'm a strong believer in what Logan and his company are doing in looking for a natural resource to boost human performance. If you want to check out the herbs that I use personally from Lost Empire Herbs, you can head to www.lostempireherbs.com slash justfly. There you can get 15% off your order, and they offer a 365-day money-back guarantee. Definitely check them out. Let's get on back to the show. Yeah, I think about, I, I like what you said, or the thing that I have synthesized that down to a little bit is I, just the idea of how you do anything is how you do everything. And the idea of even like, I've talked about this, hopefully this isn't too big of a jump, but even like organs, like the lungs are self-replicating. Like the, the smallest, the micro is a sign of what is the macro. And I I totally get that. I think that is, I um, try to collect some thoughts, but I also think that like human evolution and adaptation, like how does an athlete get better? They have to constantly be evolving. They kind of have, they have to constantly be evolving to their environment, being creative, coming up with a new battery of moves or tactical, technical solutions. If you did the same, I'd imagine if you were the sport coach and you did the exact same, um, I mean, I'm sure it happens all the time, though, probably, right? Like, the exact same drills every practice. I mean, I remember that in high school. We did the same, like, two-on-one or three-on-two, two-on-one basketball every, you know, I don't know, it was fun. But, like, I don't, beyond a certain point, that wasn't challenging me me to become a better basketball player. And uh, it it does make sense that you, if you have a warm-up that's just, we're doing the same thing, the same reps, the same, quote-unquote, perfect technique, like hammering a square peg into a round hole, it wouldn't set the mental tone that you're an adaptable, resilient human being and you can create more movement solutions. Like what's your unique signature? And so I do think it's, um, I mean, I'll just share with you what I kind of do. I'd be curious on your feedback yeah. on that, where I've gone is I kind of have three things now for the warm up. One is just, this is my boring warm up, And I, I uh, think about Jeremiah flood said something like this too, is one is just extreme ISO holds. Like if it's gonna be boring, it's that. And it's very like, Check in with your body oriented to, you have to be in with your breath, four seconds in, eight seconds out. Um, like that's the boring will oriented um, hold or thing. But then the other one is uh, here's some different things you can do. Here's you can go crawl over here. You can stand on PVC pipes over here. You can play on monkey bars over here. You can screw around with single leg squats over here on this special surface, you know, whatever. And let them just kind of play with explore each station. Like that would be my other. And then 
the third is just interactive, like stuff with dowel rods, partner stuff, throwing balls, like all that. So I, those are like my three stages. So I have a boring, I have a exploratory in the middle, and I have a full chaos <laughs> mode. I guess you could say that's kind of where I've gone with it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good. Um, that, that, that's good, Joel. So it's funny that you say that because um, for, for us in emergent, which are, we're putting on a warm up course, um, and we have three stages as well. And those three stages are ownership, exploration, and attunement. And kind of what you just talked about, uh, Joel, that first ownership piece is, you know, making sure that we're having periods of our warm up where we're giving our athletes complete ownership and autonomy. So they can, like you said, you can, you might be a crawl. So we might do some, a crawl, explore. We're giving our athletes an opportunity to explore the space in whatever manner they, you know, feel fits. So they're allowing themselves to have some, we're not dictating exactly how they move or telling them what solutions they need to, you know, use. They they have some uh, ownership there. And also ownership, you know, different periods of that we might be saying here you have two or three minutes to go on and, you know, do whatever you want with this time to get your body prepared for this next period. So we always want one of our sections is ownership. We want to give our athletes ownership. Two would be exploration, as you mentioned, Joel, would be, again, especially for youth athletes, athletes, you know, exploration is just the key to learning. That's that's just how they learn, how play exploration, you know, whether it be exploring a certain implement exploring space or exploration with a partner or multiple partners we're exploring that interaction with with an uh with other people and then the final one was an attunement and again this is gets more to you know when you get into working with specific athletes from a specific sport but attunement is you know those athletes being sensitive to specifying information in that environment so obviously as we end our warm-up we want our athletes to interact with very specific information very specific environments that they'll see within their sport that way they're obviously um, calibrating their movement solutions. They're becoming more and more sensitive to that information. So that way they're prepared for the sport. Now, those three kind of sections like a pie chart can increase or decrease depending on who you're working with. So for our youth athletes, like I said, we might do a, a very little attunement because they're youth athletes. They don't play a specific sport. Like we don't need them to necessarily attune to specific environments or situations. We want them to just explore and have abundance in their movements. And so that that slice of that uh, pie chart might be really big for exploration. If I have my NFL athletes and you know high level college football athletes that we go on the field, we might have our that pie chart might be a lot of that attunement piece because we're we're preparing to practice, we're preparing to play the sport of, of football. So that piece of that pie chart of our uh, attunement needs to be exceptionally high because we need to prepare them for very specific um, environments, which is football. And so you can kind of. Um, you know, obviously you have that pie chart ebb and flow different directions, give more or less time to certain pieces based on the population that you're coaching, the age of the you know athletes that you're coaching, their experience and things like that. And so um, kind of similar to what you just laid out there, Joel, that's kind of how we kind of talk about our warm up. Yeah. Do you with more of the I guess the boring side of it, right? Like the and I this I think about track and field a little bit as you're talking. I also am thinking about uh, just any track meet. Go to any track and it, I, I think that if we're in the strength and conditioning hat too, and we're just thinking about outputs, and we're only thinking about outputs. We're not even thinking about decision making. Even when you watch a track and field warm up, you will oftentimes see a team maybe do a general small warm up together. There's the group. There's the community piece to that. That's probably the most important of it to be honest than anything. But then they'll break apart and all athletes, they all do their own individual nuanced warm up. They all have their own routine that they're like, oh, yeah, I feel good doing this. Like you would never see. I don't think I wouldn't say never. Do you hear? But rarely would I see athletes all doing all the same event group, all doing the same exact drills, the same exact way to get ready for their event. It's like once nature takes hold, it's. And I get out of maybe the the more the group, the you know, social. And again, I think of that as just social. So if social warm up, uh, even swim coaches they call like social kick, like go have social kick or social warm up. They they call a spade a spade. This is social warm up. This has nothing to do with anything else. And then um, and then you know there's it's more nuanced. So I think about uh, anyways. The long story short is, do you have any um, like when athletes come in? Is there any general like more canned stuff that they will do? And if so, how do you approach that? Yeah, we, we have some general uh, canned stuff, if you would, but um, uh, we, like I said, we rarely run through those anymore. So we have like a board that has that. If an athlete is running tight on time uh, or an athlete needs to leave early or whatever it may be, you know, that's there for that. But when we get in our groups, like we rarely, rarely do those things. And so um, all of it's basically coach led. That's why I said to talk about it's hard for coaches because I can't just rely on the thing on a board or a piece of paper where the athletes have memorized and they can just go through it. And I can kind of sit there for 10 minutes and just kind of space out or not really be actively involved. Like 
all of our sessions now, it's like the coach, we're actively involved. We're interacting with our athletes. We're asking questions. We're getting feedback. We're, uh, we're allowing them some time to do some uh, things on their, uh, on their own. So the warps are, are, are alive and they're adapting each and every session because um, that's what our sessions kind of, that's just how I feel is the best to um, connect and interact with our athletes. So we do have some, I guess, prescribed warmups, but like I said, we, we very rarely use those unless there's some sort of uh, uh, constraint in a hand that the athlete needs to leave early or whatnot. Uh, Michael, you're a, you're a football player. Uh, and I was not. And so I'll ask you this. It's just, I think that in the world of football, and this is an, I think from observations is it's very often very regimented, very hold the line. Don't, you know, you have to do your job and that being an important part of the social construct. And I, so just in thinking about that, I think about like a football warm, we're all doing the same thing. We're all doing it together. And we're trying to bring that over into whatever's going on in the field. And again, this is where, you know, far better than I, but what's your thought on that? Like, I guess, mentality of, of do the thing, do it right, like right, right on the right time. But that is more regimented versus the creativity that happens in the, in the course of play. Um, just kind of reconciling those two things, because I have no idea. Like, I'm <laughs> deferring to yeah. that one. And I'm, I'm probably not the, the, the best person to speak about that, because I know there's many people who think those things are important. I just, I just don't. I think that's all uh, eyewash. I don't think it actually transfers to the game that those things that yeah whether you be behind the line or touch the line you're going to start in the clap i think it's just oh, oh, i washed it doesn't have any sort of uh, transferability to those athletes being more disciplined or uh, more focused or whatever it may be when they actually get in their sport and so I, like i said i think those things kill creativity and they mm-hmm. kill decision making and they kill I, you know and maybe i'm different on this but i i I'm a big fan of allowing each and every athlete's kind of individualism, you know, stand out. And and obviously team sports usually do the opposite. They try to kill that. You're, yeah. This is a team first, you know, and, and they just try to anything that has any sort of individualistic um, art or any, you know, style, they, they try to kill out because it's, you know, it's at, they say the decrement to the team. And I just, I just can't agree with that. So I'm probably not a great person to speak on behalf of uh um, team sports because I'm definitely I probably hold more of an individual sport type of a uh, uh, feeling on that because I, I just I just I don't think that we need to make everyone look alike and make everyone move alike and make everyone you know start behind the line I think all those things just they don't matter they, I think those things do not increase discipline I mean you can see it year in and year out um, you know like the New York Giants this year in football I mean they're they're god awful and you know their coach is a milit- militaristic type of coach where they, they are disciplining these professional athletes for doing things wrong. They're running they're, 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 all these things. And you can see these, these guys make mistakes in crunch times all the time. So it's like what you're doing in a non-contextual environment has no bearing on what's going to happen within the actual heat and the contextual environment of the game. So I just, uh, uh, I, I would value the more individualistic styles, the creativity, um, allowing athletes, like I said, ownership much more than, the the this culture of discipline this culture of of uh, you know teamwork and things like that you know and then the other thing that always drove me nuts too was you know train with your team you know they always you know again i went to a smaller school and sometimes in the summer guys would be off working jobs or doing internships and um or just you know not being able to train at the time that our team trained and there's always a big thing like you know you need to train together as a team you know because we build this this teamwork and i never looked at like a third and short i looked to my left or right and like hey Hey, that guy over there, he wasn't during the, there during summer workouts. So I don't trust him. Like what? Like you don't like those things don't build trust and, and, and teamwork and things like that. Like those things never actually show up in the game. I, I never saw a guy and, you know, didn't trust him because he wasn't at summer workouts because he was out on summer vacation or was working a job. Like those things never come up. So it's just, it's just mundane eyewash the stuff that people think they blow out of proportion in my opinion. Yeah. That whole idea. And again, I, I like talking with, I mean, I, I didn't play football and I, I about my team sport was basketball. And I personally was much more of an individual sport person. I ended up in track and field, which is the epitome of that. Right. And, but even playing basketball, I think basketball compared to other sports, I mean, especially now in the NBA, I mean, the way that the game is played now is so individualistic, but even then this is like, I feel like there's more room, a little more room for style and, and all that. And so that being my bias, having played those sports, I mean, I would totally agree with you. I, I would be interested to have a more global conversation on that as well. I think it would be really interesting to go through case studies, like you said, the giant, the militaristic style, where are the critical mistakes being made. And I, you're definitely not the first person I've heard that from. I've like Kirwan and Flat and uh, Eric Coram were on talking about those kind of things. And like, maybe it's more systematic of just the general grind mentality. The harder, you know, that 
if you just grind really hard and you're, you know, all this, then of course you're going to win or whatever. And there's so much more to it than that. It's just, that's a very kind of one-sided way of looking at it. So maybe that'll, that I'll have to keep thinking about that for more, um, more discussion. I really intrigued by that idea because that idea fundamentally determines just about everything else you're doing. If the most grinding militaristic discipline team in that sense was always the ones winning and not making mistakes, then I think there would be more of a ground to stand on. Cause I, I do think this, that fundamental concept does filter down to everything else. Like if that, if that is the case, then I think that we can make the case all the way down the chain. But I do feel like I have seen that even in the weight room, the teams that grind or even the individuals that come in and do extra weight room and have the grind mentality, they're not the ones who are the stars. Like they're the ones who are hoping to get off the bench. Like, and a lot of them oh, yeah. took out their not being able to play very well on just lifting more weights and being that weight room rat type, gym rat type person. So anyways, I think there's yeah. a lot more that could be said with that. Yeah, there, there, that'd be a really good discussion. And um yeah, what it comes down to, I don't know, you know, coaches don't want to let, you know, let go of some of that control that they have. And I don't know, it's just something that just being in, in a decade here working, in the, you know, primarily with, uh, you know, youth athletes just kills me to see that kind of stuff trickle down then to the youth levels. And so like, you'll see like middle school, uh, you know, sixth and seventh graders now that, you know, they're starting weight room programs for those, those athletes. And, you know, and there was a video, some school in Texas, when they're all on a, you know, on a whistle, they all went down and all went up in the back squat. And I just thought, <laughs> These are like twelve year olds. What the fuck are we doing them in a weight room, squatting on a whistle? Like, and the behind the weight room was a beautiful indoor like football field turf area. Like, oh my god, look at that space! Look what all the things you could be doing with that instead mm. of confining them to a goddamn squat rack, all on the whistle. Next person in line standing behind, and another kid in line standing behind that. Like, so there's like you know one third of the the group is working, the rest are staying back there. It's like this. This is really what you guys think. 12 year olds need and what they want i mean give me a goddamn break come on it's just because it, it, that trickles down so we see we, people think that like saban and belichick are really militaristic if you really actually study those guys they're they're a lot more uh, lenient and, and and give freedom and autonomy and they let individual styles you know show out much more than people think so that you know you get some of these successful coaches that we think are just hard asses and at the end of the day if you really talk to people that were in those environments they're actually a lot looser than you know what the public per you know, eye perceives and so yeah and obviously here we're here in america where the military is obviously a huge deal and so that kind of trickles down to all areas of uh of sport and i just i just i don't know it's just not i i i'm and i'm biased but against those things and so um i'm pretty vocal that i you know i just think those things are, are um are more destructive than they are benefiting our, our athletes, specifically youth athletes. Yeah. Oh, youth. A hundred percent. Yeah. I've had, it's, you know, Jamie Smith was talking about that and just like, it's like, how early are we going to start athletes being these automatons? Like it it's, you know, maybe it used to be 16, now it's 12 or whatever, doing squats on the whistle. It's, I mean, and yeah, we, before we even recorded you and I just talked about youth sports, like I'm coaching my five-year-old daughter's soccer team and just, you already can see like how the, the ability, the perception reaction and the, creative movement is going to yield something great later down the road for so many of these athletes. And yeah, it's just, it's really interesting things. I, I do think about even the, like the Nick Saban or Bill Belichick, it's almost the, the idea I get is you're, you're a hard ass where you need to be and you allow creativity where you need to be. And that is like the wisdom of these coaches who have been doing it a long time. I, at least that's what strikes me. It's, I think yeah. it's not, it's a versus just being yeah. all one way, you know, or the other. Exactly. And th- those two of the most adaptable coaches that again, we're specifically talking about, of football here, but those are two most adaptable coaches that we, we've seen. Many, many people try to copy what they do, and they, they're not ever anywhere near as successful because those two are always constantly adapting, adapting their coaching style, adapting their philosophies. Like you said, they're, they're going to be uh, strict on certain things, but you look at how they adapted to the, the rule changes and the styles of, of, of football, and they're the first ones on board to, to change what they're doing, to change their styles. They don't have a certain style, you know, year in and year out. They're adapting how they coach to the players that they have in, obviously on their team. And then also they're adapting to the rule changes or adapting to the style changes within college football or the NFL. They're two most adaptable coaches, you know, out there. They don't have, they don't hold on to this. Like I'm always going to be this, you know, strict militaristic dictator type. I'm always adapting who they are and how they're doing it year in and year out. That's why they're successful. And that again, that starts from a coaching style. Like I, I think that's what athletes need as well. Like if you look at the successful athletes that play for a long time, it's because they're constantly adapting. Mm-hmm. Um, 
their style, who they are year in and year out. Uh, and they they all have their own very unique individualistic style and movement signature that, you know, it is unique to them. And they're obviously always constantly updating and uh, adapting and adjusting those things year in and year out. And so how you get, for me, if it starts, if every, every track practice, every training session starts with a warm up, uh, shouldn't we be like really emphasizing those things that those are important to us? Cause if we're not, if we're emphasizing the exact opposite during our warm up, also you think they're going to athletes are going to turn a switch during our, our lifting session or on field session or speed sessions or our practices. They're also going to turn a switch and become now this adaptable, creative, abundant mover. When in a warm up, we just we just stripped away all that kind of stuff, and so I think that's why I think the warm up is a really extremely important thing for our athletes because it I think it sets a tone and dictates everything moving forward um, from that point. And so if it's going to be the exact opposite of what you're preaching to your athletes, then I think you're you're again you're causing more harm than than you are good. Yeah, I think there's just it's this is a global conversation. Just it's with everything in society, the structured versus unstructured, and just how. It's like this, where does this urge to overstructure everything come from just globally? And then it does seem, it does seem like in the grand scheme of team sports, the, the weight room is always the wing where it's like even more structure and discipline. And again, I'm, I believe from a social perspective, yes, like, like that's great. Like the social and that part, but like, you know, in the movement, every movement and exploration and everything else, like it's just, how do we, how do we create this without like appropriately without turning people into automatons and robots? Uh, yeah. Oh, do you have a quick follow up there? Otherwise, I have another question for you. No, no, no okay. that's a good thought, though. Yeah, that's that's a yeah, that's a that's a that's a big heavy concept. I think I, I'm going to keep that in my memory banks. I would love to actually maybe like even in an interdisciplinary perspective. I think the more people from other fields we get talking about this kind of thing, I think it goes well beyond sport. And the more we see from other fields, I think a lot of times we can learn more about sport sport from seeing what's going on um, in fields outside of ourselves. Yeah. And it, it, that, that, like you said, Joe, that would be a really good practice, I think, for coaches, because if you do look at, you know, some of the most successful people in other fields, like, and I've done it in a few fields, but I, you know, obviously if you look at most fields, if you think of the people that are really, really successful, like look at their backgrounds and where they came from. It, the story will tell itself that usually they came from, they were like outcasts or they did things differently, or they, you know, had their own unique uh, adaptation of what they perceived was possible. And that's why they were successful. They had this, this technological or whatever kind of breakthrough in whatever their field is, is because they didn't follow everybody else. They, they were their own person. They were creative. Um, and they, they, you know, didn't model this kind of robotic, uh, you know, practice that everyone else in that field was doing. Hence why they had breakthroughs and hence why they're some of the most successful people. So it, yeah, if, if coaches would study those other fields and see, well, well geez, the, you know, person A, B, and C are, you know, breakthrough people in their fields of, of, of study or fields of work because they they went in the opposite direction as everybody else. They, they were their own person, their own unique individual, and they, they, they were adapting year in, year out and creative, hence why they're successful. And so, like you said, Joe, I think if coaches did that more often, they'd see uh, um, they could pull some of those key p- uh, components from other fields into coaching and yeah. how they, you know, prepare our athletes. Yeah, this this question is a little off the cuff, but if you were to design yeah. a curriculum, like okay, you're going to be a athlete performance coach or whatever. It's like what 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 like key if you had like two or three or four like groups and like settings that you want said you should be work here. Like you should work with youth sports ages five to eight or something. You should work with an elite coach like a you know a Nick Saban or Bill Belichick or just observe or study that. You know what I'm saying? Like. What do you have any like settings and athletes that, would, that you feel like would be really valuable for pretty much any coach, like a global coach who's going to work with athletes in an athletic performance situation? Oh man, that's a big one, Joe, huh? I, I you know, obviously you, you touched on it with the youth, like, you know, work with young athletes would be a, and we, we, we kind of talked about this off camera, but you know, our, our field of strength conditioning uh, and coaching in general, uh, you know, they give a lot of lip service to, you know, youth coaches or, you know, middle school, high school coaches and saying, you know, that's where oftentimes where some of the best coaches is at or the most impactful coaching can be. But then a lot of people saying that, you know, don't actually coach those populations. And that's kind of funny because there's actually like, there's zero, you know, barrier of entry to coach youth athletes. Like 90% of us tomorrow could be in front of a youth athletes or youth parents and, and be coaching them, whether it be just through a warm up. Um, all these sporting organizations are looking for uh, volunteers to help coach youth athletes or youth teams or, or you know, whatever, or YMCAs or wherever it may be. 
it's not hard to get into, you know, in front of youth athletes like tomorrow. And so if this is so important, I think all of our coaches should be striving to actually do these things um, in some capacity, no matter what level that you're at. And, and if it's the most impactful and most important um, time of an athlete's life, then I shouldn't all of our coaches be striving to actually, you know, be involved during that time frame. So obviously I think it would be youth athletes. And that's obviously changed who I am as a coach. And uh, um, it's probably been the most impactful uh, has been working with youth athletes, just how it's changed my mindset and, and, and you know, philosophy of working even with higher level athletes, you know, my time and my time currently spent with youth athletes, it, you know, changes all that. So A would be um, working with youth athletes. Um, yeah, outside of that, you know, I don't know, I, I think it would be worthwhile to work with elite level athletes to just see how different that is and um, maybe have a little bit of eye opening of, of, you know, the business behind all that because there is a, a huge, that's obviously, you know, it's all a business. Um, it's kind of scary, you know, from the naive person just to see how, um, how cutthroat and how, you know, just business like all that stuff is. And so it, it's very different in the stress and the, uh, um, on coaches, on players that they have outside of just, you know, what we see, you know, on a, you know, uh, NFL Sunday, we see the game, but we don't see the other seven days of the week that our athletes are under immense amounts of stress and pressure doing all these different other things. So we often know at times don't see those things. Um, so I think it'd be valuable to observe or just see those things from coaches and players. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd say was that, you know, every, every set situation and environment is going to be different for each coach. And so I, you know, I've had coaches ask me in the past about, you know, a business model of how we run things here at BBA and, you know, you should create something that uh, um, kind of demonstrates, you know, what you've done to build, you know, BBA. And I'm just like, I, I just, I can't bring myself to ever make something like that because each person's own situation and environment is going to be unique to them. And it has to be unique to their personalities and how they coach and things like that. And so I think it'd be a disservice to try to create something that other coaches then would try to, you know, uh, copy and paste or plug and play because it doesn't work like that. And that's a hard thing with coaching as well. Like even in these things that you can't plug and play these things. So, you know, how we, how my warmers are going to look up this afternoon, there's no plug and play or your copy and paste function that I can give the coaches because I don't even know what's going to look like at the end of the day, because we're, it's an adaptive process. And so coaches, I think you have to trust themselves and be, you know, be true to who you are and be authentic and organic. And, and I think that will allow the best environment to co come out wherever you're coaching. So not try to copy and, and try, or try to be somebody else, but rather just let your own uh, unique uh, personality and unique individualism come out when you coach, because I think that would be the most powerful environment for you as a coach, rather than trying to, uh, you know, plug and play or copy someone else's environments or business philosophy or business principles or and things like that. Yeah, for sure. I think I like just how you mentioned the polarities too. There's the working with youth and then seeing the the final result if you get there and on what's happening with the elite and just kind of like helping you to understand what actually happens in the middle a lot more. I, I know I've grown immensely by even just coaching my uh, daughter's five-year-old soccer. And I feel like soccer is even a loose word term at that age. I don't know if you could <laughs> even call it soccer at that point, but just being a uh, physical activity with the emphasis of soccer coach, I've learned so much and just being able to watch, um, you know, if I stay in it long enough, 10 years, just to see the kids that end up maybe playing for the high school team and knowing what they were like and knowing um, just their their movement styles and how they grew and evolved and like all the the elements the social and emotional elements of it as well that that feed into it i i'm already learning a ton so I, I i agree i think that and it's so easy too just there's so many youth coaches who are needed it's i mean it's such a valuable thing i just i'm really happy that i've volunteered my time and i hope a lot of other coaches do as well yeah it's just it's such a rewarding you know and obviously it's usually volunteer work and it's usually unpaid and, and things like that, but it's so, so rewarding um, to work with those populations. Like you said, it, it can be difficult. I'm sure your, your, your practices with your soccer team, your, your five-year-old soccer team can be somewhat difficult at times, just kind of corralling, you know, uh, you know, 12 to 15, you know, five-year-olds to try to get them to listen for two seconds, but that's mm -hmm. part of the fun. And that's mm -hmm. part of like, you know what, maybe I don't need to have a lecture before my practice and, or have these, you know, elaborate drills that they need to look pretty and clean. Like part of the fun is just letting them go wild for 15 minutes. That's, that's honestly what they need most. And, and play is the hard work, the hard learning of youth athletes. That's what play is. It really is. It's the hard work and, and the learning of all, of, all human beings. And I think we oftentimes think that, well, you know, games and small side games and play and free play and you know, these kind of um, 
loose warmups that, you know, you'll see that, you know, that I use is strictly for, you know, novice youth, middle school, high school athletes. Like there's no place for that for, for college athletes, professional athletes. Like what? All my professional athletes, that's all they want to do. Mm-hmm. Like at the end of the day, sports is just a game. It's just play. Yes. And so we, we all have this inherent deep need and desire for play. It's, it's our deep learning. It's a very, so, like you said, it's very socially engaging. It has a strong social key uh, tied to it. It's emotional, psychological. I mean, play is the hard work of, of human beings. I have like, on our, we have adult class as well. So we have 40, 50, 60 year olds in our adult class who are CEOs, have high stress jobs. And guess what they want to do? Like tomorrow will be Friday morning. We're going to play for 45 minutes of our session. Mm-hmm. We'll just play various games. Like, we are a species of play and it doesn't die out just because you, 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 you turn 13 years old, like the need for play just dies out. No, all, all of our athletes. And when I, my professional football players come back, the first month will be, you know, a lot of it because, because I know the nature of like the NFL and how just demanding that is from a, a, a emotional, psychological uh, standpoint and the, the stress and the pressure of day in and day out. We're going to play like kids games for the first month to try to just, you know, you know, erase some of that to, you know, so they can lose some of that, that burden that they hold on their shoulders. Uh, so to think that, that, you know, place should, 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 should somehow stop when athletes become a little bit more higher level or they, they're no longer, you know, young athletes or they get into college or professional is just, it's just silly. Um, we all have this desire and need to play. So, um, and that's what the warm ups I think should, should gear towards. Uh, is a little bit more play-based warm-ups, exploration-based warm-ups, rather than um, these kind of, like we've talked about for an hour now, this robotical-style warm-ups. You know, one thought that I had in coaching the five-year-old soccer group, and I'd be curious how you would go with this, is I, I had the idea, I try to, um, and they when they're doing, um, the group I coach, they have great coaching education. They're like, you know, just play a lot of games with them, not even soccer, not with a soccer ball. And so I just notice when we just play freeze tag, and they have to like, you know, to get unfrozen, you have to throw the ball or kick the ball between the other person's legs who is frozen or whatever, like stuff like that. That's easy. Like the intention is through the roof. There's no need for me to really like manage it because they know what to do. It's really simple. But then as soon as we get into something like um, they have two lines and I'll blow the whistle and one, ki- they each run out and try to score a goal. Like they can kind of manage that. But then much beyond that, any more layers deep, it's done. Like it's too much. And I think to myself, if I was to keep trying that that thing that's too much for them, they're not going to have fun. They're not going to learn. It's going to be boring. Like, but that, I feel like, doesn't just exist on that five-year-old level. It exists all the levels up in the sense of how much are you capable of where this is play? Maybe it's stretching my, like, it's stretching me. Like, I can still manage this. Then versus, oh, it's too much. It's too rigid. There's too many constraints. I, I feel like that goes all the way up. Like, where, you know, and same thing we're talking about being a robot or whatnot, but it's something I'm thinking about even with the young athletes and just trying to find this maximal engagement where I don't need to be like hurting sheep, you know, like, yes, I need, do need to set the tone with listening and like, let's circle up, let's put on our listening ears. But once they're actually going, once it's, it's in motion, I think about how much should the coach be doing? And, and so I'm learning on the five-year-old level right now, but I feel like that it goes all the way up, you know, as, as athletes can handle more, but it still is in play. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, a big push the last, uh, you know, number of years, uh, from those kind of taking like an ecological approach to coaching is that, that they see themselves as coaches as more of a environmental designer or like an architect. So that we're reading, like you said, Joel, like the, the role of the coach then is to kind of see um, is design environments and to see how those athletes are interacting within those environments. And then obviously push and pull certain buttons, you know, adjust certain constraints to, again, like you said, better fun, best functionally fit your athletes where they're at. So they're being stretched, but you're like, you said, they're not, beyond that kind of that challenge point where then they kind of might shut down because it is obviously too difficult. So as a coach, it's, it's more pushing and pulling those you know, various buttons to allow a really like just a rich interaction with your athletes and, and, and those athletes with the environment. Um, and so it, you know, like you said, it might be adding more or less balls, it might be adding more or less people, more or less space changing or just manipulating the rules um, adding like, you know, the big thing with our youth athletes is we'll, yeah, we'll do things like we're, they get superpowers. So they all love superpowers. So, Hey, this, you know, if you, you score this goal or if you touch the ball, you get an extra two points. So finding ways to get people involved and give them feel special in certain moments, um, is a, all those things are really beneficial for, for youngsters. And as a coach, you just see yourself as, all right, let me pull this string here, you know, push this button there to allow, like you said, 
the most uh, um, beneficial environment for all of our athletes. And the more laughing, the more screaming, the louder the, the, the environment is, it's usually the better rather than, you know, seeing like, Oh God, they're all laughing and screaming. And, you know, like many coaches think that that's a bad thing. Like for athletes, that, that should be seen as a, for young athletes, that should be seen as a really powerful thing. Cause that means they're just fully immersed and engaged in that environment. Yeah. It's almost like if you wanted a, this world we live in where we always ha- need to have some sort of data or uh, <laughs> quantitative feedback. What if you just had a decibel meter for the youth groups and say, yeah. this is how good this session was. The decibel meter was this high. It was great. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And I, I've heard some other youth coaches talk about like, uh, like, like, like the laughing scale or laughing meter, same thing. The number of laughs, the better, like the more laughing and, and shouting, like you said, uh, those things are, those are things that are, are, we need to seek those things out. And, um, I know that obviously the, topic now is youth, but that, that should not just, you know, you know, stop as they get older. I think it was Buddy Morris who said, you know, during his warm up, you know, he could d- tell how the day was going to go by the amount of chatter uh, and, yeah. and talkativeness in his groups, the more, the better. So like, again, uh, um, the more, you know, talkative, the louder the group was, the more they maybe weren't like listening. He's like, all right, this will be a good day. These guys are, are on the quieter, the more diminutive, the, the, body language and the less talking he's like oh these guys are not gonna have a good day these guys are, are beat so it doesn't stop at just youth athletes i think all some of these pieces can be pulled to all levels of, of athletes yeah i would agree i'd say the same thing would exist in the games i played before the uh, workout with the college age athletes it's just same things apply i mean obviously <laughs> you don't want to create the impression of complete and utter mass chaos i although i i remember one time i did a i don't want to get off topic because i do want to ask you about outputs but like i remember there was a swim dry land that I did one time. Uh, it was on a training trip. The The men's team was on uh, at Cal with the, at the Olympic training center and they were going to do dry land. And it was in like, you know, just a lot of like core work and those types of things. We're gonna do a lot of crawls and, you know, core and those and whatnot medicine balls. I don't remember if they had them in there, but I just remember um, looking around. I was like, this is a huge wrestling room. We sh- And then I, I walked in the, uh, I walked in the bathroom before we were going to start. And I saw some or the locker room and I saw some wrestlers in there who had just finished. And I asked them, I was like, Hey, what's a what's like a good game wrestling game you got could play without like hurting the other person and they they were telling me like basically like a knee tap game where you just try to tap the other guy's knee and you can't you aren't allowed to dive because then you could maybe get hurt and we just orchestrated a big tournament of that for like 20 minutes and it was just pandemonium in the best possible way like if when i think decibel meter and people just laughing and yelling and having fun like that was literally the most fun like the most fun and and so i i think about that it was just such a cool time and on that 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 point, Joel, like if you just uh, pull back for a little bit and maybe put on your coaching lens. So again, for those uh, coaches that maybe um, not as uh, you know open to trying some of these things out, like if you just pull back and just watch that environment you just described there, your athletes would be hitting positions and shapes and ranges of motion mm-hmm. that would be opening up their degrees of freedom or opening up their mobility, right? So they're they're getting in these positions and shapes that you would. Through a, a, you know, a t- classical dynamic warm up. So you're getting these, the, the body temperature is increasing. You're getting, you know, progressively deeper and bigger ranges of motions. I'm sure if they went, go, uh, went going throughout that the tournament, the speeds and the complexity of their movements were also increasing. So you're accomplishing all the same things as you would from a classical warm up. You want to get the body temperature increased. You want to increase ranges of motion. You want to progressively increase the speeds. Like all those things can be done in play and game like act- environments. So your athletes, I'm sure after they finished that, were all really loose, all really, uh, you know, obviously their body temperature, they probably had a sweat going. Like, so you can, like, doing the the basics of what you want to accomplish during a warm-up are, are, it can be done in a lot of different ways. And so as you describe that environment, because we use that, we call that knee tag, and we do shoulder tag, and we do, you know, foot tag, things like that. Like, the athletes are going through ranges of motions that we want our athletes to go through. They're, they're going through speeds that we want them to go through. So. Um, their nervous system is getting, you know, obviously stimulated and, and right for, for whatever we're going to go into on next. So to think that a classical dynamic warm is the only way to accomplish this thing is just silly. And so um, that that's a great example you just laid out there. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you're getting literally in five minutes of doing something like that. You're getting 20 minutes worth of all the robotic stuff that you'd go through and you're doing it better, like, and you're having fun. And just something funny about that too, with that, that whole time is I remember like the, the Olympians in that group were kind of taking it easy, you know, try, not trying to go too hard, but the guys who didn't, who were like kind of the lower on the totem pole, weren't going to score at the conference meet. They were like laying out, like one guy actually hurt his shoulder who, again, a guy who wasn't going to be a, and he was fine. Like a couple days later, he was fine. But like the guys who 
it's just funny because the the people who have nothing to lose, like they're going to get lost in the play. They're like, I love this so much. I'm going to dive. <laughs> I'm going to do this. But that's always hard to tell your coach like, hey, so-and-so dived in this game that I just came up with. And, um, you know, he's he's not going to be able to swim like very well for a couple of days. But I, I, everyone's self-managed. Everyone else self-managed spectacularly and got an amazing movement quality. Uh, so based off what you were just saying too, like play opening up movement options. Uh, I was talking with Jake Tura and um jeremiah flood uh, i think jake true actually spent time with jeremiah flood but they were doing um like playing gator ball which is like a, just a movement game and then doing 10 meter flies in the middle like every 20 30 minutes go do a 10 meter fly go do a 10 meter fly and jake was just saying every time i just got faster and faster and i've found that i just before i even heard that i was starting to intersperse 20 meter sprints 20 yard dashes in the gym with like we're going to play some soccer all right we'll take a 10 minute break and run and i saw i saw one guy drop two tenths on his time doing that like off of a normal warm-up right like crazy stuff like just to, and bobby stroop had said the same thing do the pro agility before you do the 40 the 40 is better and so just from an outputs because i know a lot of people listening might think well i'm not i'm not in charge of the technical tactical and you know whatever but like so if we just switch our hat and just say okay well all right well if we do forget all that which i never would want to but if we just were thinking outputs and put the output hat on i feel like this stuff can be really helpful for outputs as well and so if you're talking, like if your group is going to do um, like a, a sprint time or if they're going to do a heavier lift or something, uh, do you, how does, does it change at all when you go? I mean, I imagine you get a little more specific or uh, how does, how do you usually lead up to when you're going to be doing a more output driven thing in the gym? Um, like I said, it depends, but yeah, obviously we're going to, the last piece of that, that warm up, um, as I talked about, will be some sort of like a an entombment piece. So whatever that work is for that specific day, we're trying to get our athletes obviously, you know, crossing that bridge to be ready for whatever that, that is. Um, but like I said, it, you know, it changes day to day. Uh, I, again, I don't go in with a set plan of that. I need to make sure I hit these things before we get into our, our whatever be sprint work or agility work or weight room work. Um, it, it, again, I think it all depends on the Kenny, as you just laid out there, I, I there's, we think that sometimes we have to get, so if we have a sprint session, we definitely have to go through our A skips and our, mm -hmm. you know, switches and double, triple A switches or, you know, boom, booms, whatever people call them. And you got to do your prime times and your technical build ups, whatever it be. We have to get all those done before we get in our sprint work. And I just think that's, I, I don't think that's the case. So I, I don't necessarily have a plan that we have to hit these things in order to be prepared for our sprint work or whatever, or, or, or agility work. Um, I, like you said, as some of those coaches that you mentioned talked about and you've seen, I, I think sometimes getting our athletes to do, um, almost the opposite of what they're going to do for that day can, can be really beneficial. Again, I work with a lot of sprinters and so getting them in the front door and transverse plane, it, it, you know, is really beneficial to them because they never live in that when they're in their sport. And so we might, we might open up some of the degrees of freedom. We might open up some of these ranges of motion. We might open up some, you know, the central nervous system to be a little bit more fluid and efficient in the, uh, um, in when they get into their sprinting than if we didn't do those things. So, um, yeah, I, I I don't have a set plan, but I I, I there's not definitely like a checklist that I want to hit before we get into any sort of uh, um, activity. Michael, the, we we've been going about an hour on probably kind of one question, <laughs> but I, so here I'm going to ask the second part of that first question. And so you mentioned initially like the last decade, um, your changes. Have there been any more specific changes that have really been like the last two years? You're like, wow, like this is a really cool twist or add on to what I've been doing anything that's been major or it's just kind of been a gradual like uh, of the same character of what we've been talking about um i'd say it's been fairly gradual would be i, I guess uh, my assessment of that i i i think the only other thing i've you know really the last couple of years tried and i want to do a little more is, is different like um different challenges i know our athletes like that um or different levels of things so like for example we might just get out some tennis balls and I might have like six levels of that you want to accomplish. So what I've been looking into that it goes stems back to is like, is using like is studying video games. Well, how are video games so um, successful for, for youth athletes or just, you know, just um, anybody in general, w what makes the video games so engaging um, that they pull away from, you know, people participating in sports, people being physically active or doing other things. Like you're being sedentary, you're playing a video game. Like, if you look, if you think back on it, look at it, it's, it shouldn't be as successful as it is, but what makes video games successful? So there's been some literature and science done on this. And what they've kind of seen is that, you know, obviously video games are, um, they're inclusive. So obviously everybody can, can be involved with them. 
Uh, they tell a story. So you think about, you know, my favorite game, video game growing up was like Super Mario Brothers, where you're trying to beat levels and you're trying to save uh, the princess. Like, so they think that they tell a story. Um, going back to that, there's levels. Like, there's, so there's, you know, it, it is unique to each person. So I could be playing Super Mario Brothers and be in level, you know, five. And Joel, you could play, be playing it and be on level 15. So there's different levels that are, you know, are really suited to where each person is, 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 is at. And so I thought about that, you know, um, how can we, I do some of these things in my games, my warmups and things like that. So um, I've developed just various games or various levels or trying to tell more stories and how we, mm. uh, uh, how we set up and design our, our activities. And so, for example, like that, that we might be using, right. We're going to use tennis balls today for a warmup. So again, we might have a five minute period where you guys see, have to take two, three tennis balls, explore wherever you guys want with the tennis balls. You can roll them, you can toss them, you can use them to roll out. Um, you know, people might dribble them. There's, you know, we might give them some freedom to explore if they want. Um, we might then, you know, work with some, um, uh, with a partner during the exploration, find different ways to pass the ball back and forth. So we're getting some collaboration. You're working with another athlete in that environment. And then at the end, we might have, I might have, all right, we're going to put five minutes in the clock. I, here's, here's our six levels. Level one, you got to catch one ball, you know, behind your back. Level two, you got to catch two balls, you know, um, and do a 360. So there might be different levels where they gradually get increased in their difficulty. So we're like a video game, athletes, so one athlete might be in level two, by the end of five minutes, one athlete then might be at level five. So you're, we're a, we're, we're fit, fitting each athlete where they're at. They're getting challenged. They're trying to, to accomplish this goal, this task of video games to get to the next level, trying to unlock the next level. Um, and so I'm trying to steal some components from video games and, and tie it into how we do our warmups, tie it into how I do some of my small, small sided games and games in general has been very beneficial. And that's where I talked about earlier in the podcast, giving people like superpowers, right? You know, mm-hmm. I revert back to super Mario brothers, but when you, you get the star and you're invincible and you can just run through everything. So, you know, giving some of our athletes superpowers or, or um, super, you know, where they have, when they score, it's worth double the points. So finding ways to steal some of these things that make video games so engaging and so benefit, you know, make you know, people want to play video games. How can we actually apply those into our sports? Um, why are sports numbers dying, but video game participation increasing? Well, Instead of being mad at video games and saying they're, they're, they're bad for athletes or bad for just people in general, they lead to sedentary lifestyle, um, et cetera. Well, they actually do some, some things very, very well. Well, why not we steal some of those things and apply it to our sports or apply it to our training to make them you know, more engaging um, and just more likely for athletes to participate in? So that's, I guess, would be the last two years. I've, I've studied a lot in that uh, and trying to find ways. It's hard, but trying to find ways to apply some of those principles into our, 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 my practice. That's amazing. Whenever you get the the formal like sheet or or product that comes out with all those like levels and games, like I'm I'm gonna be the first one to buy it. I <laughs> I was listening to a podcast it was maybe like a couple of years ago. It was Aubrey Marcus and Eric Godsey talking about um just like why are role playing games so addictive? And it's because you're always leveling up, next level. I ex- you know I and if we thought about life like that, like real life, not something that, again, you know, I think there's a healthy balance with playing, you know, video games. I don't anymore. I used to play a lot of them. And, but like all those principles of, of um, evolution and progression, and you put that in something like games, like, man, what a difference. I just think that's, that's so huge. Like that could change the world right there, Michael. I, I, what's that like? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. This is definitely not my idea. Uh, um, I've this, there's been people that have, have, have uh, been vouching for this for a number of years and there's some, actually some science literature on it, but yeah, it, it is, you know, uh, people play video games because, and you know, especially, you know, now, but they, there's uh, this, this social piece to it too, where they're playing online and they have buddies and people that they play with. Um, many times sports can be somewhat um, combative or too competitive where it's me versus you. Mm-hmm. I get to play, you have to sit. And so, you know, it, people oftentimes don't like that. They like to be more collaborative. Um, like you said, the levels, people love levels in, in video games. It's, you know, so I, I think there are, like we, we mentioned this earlier, but there's so many other fields that we could probably pull from and steal from and apply it to sport or apply it to strength conditioning. That would, I think, be a lot more fun and engaging for our athletes and um, just to want, have them want to be, you know, involved or active and things like that. Yeah, that makes me think about, I mean, <laughs> this podcast is going a little different direction on some levels than I had <laughs> anticipated, but it's, I mean, this, it's such an important topic. And I mean, even just being in youth sports now, you look at the, the statistics of when do kids quit? When do they stop playing? And when they stop playing, they probably stop moving uh, largely. Maybe they get into working out or fitness or whatever, and you know, hopefully they keep moving. But 
it's um, a guest who I will have on the show, Frank Ferencic, who wrote The Exuberant Animal. I read his book at Rafe Kelly's Return to the Source Summer. Or I should say I skimmed it and then bought it later. But he talks about the idea of the, these archetypes that you have in nature. You have chimps and bonobos. And chimps are very much, um, you could think of that as very much like either you play or you don't. You win or you lose. Very hierarchical. Um, it's what a lot of, I think, the modern sports system is modeled after. And I'm not saying it's bad. It's just it's just what it is. If you want to be a good elite athlete and you make the team, you you did or you didn't. But then the bonobos are more like the artists. It's the moving for the sake of moving. And so I think that it's just this thing where the sport system is so modeled after just this hierarchical grind. You win or you lose, play or you don't play. And then we kind of forget all this, the process and the enjoyment of just moving and playing for the sake of playing and weaving that in. And I just think that's really powerful. And I think those scaling systems of your level this and just having fun in the games. And I would imagine a lot of times when you're playing those games, the athletes aren't actually thinking of their main sport. Like there's that definitive break where you shouldn't be. Like you're just being a human. You're just enjoying general skills and having fun. Absolutely. And that's 100% the point, Joe. And that's um, another course we, we worked on, Origins, talking about youth athletes. But that's the thing. It's so scary, the, the statistics of when kids quit. Like, it's like 60 or 70% of kids are quitting by age 12 or 13 years of age. So you're losing the majority of the population are, are just done from sports at, at, you know, by the time they get to eighth grade, that's, that's crazy talk. And my other issue uh, with some of the, you know, your LTAD long-term, uh, long-term athletic development model, <laughs> I have a little bit of a uh, issue with some of those things, because if you look at most of them, like at 18 years, years of age, like they just stop, like, it's just like done. So what happens from 18 to 80? Like, are we not concerned about that uh, time frame? Like that's the majority of one's life. I, it just says, you know, 18, you know, on, you know, whatever, you know, just sport for life. Like we have no deeper dive into, you know, getting people involved. That's for like youth athletes or youth coaches, excuse me. Um, the two most important things that they should be doing is a, they should be judged on retention from year to year. Like my kids should be retained the next year. Not just because to play the sport, because we talked about the physical, emotional, social benefits of, of being involved in physical activity with other people is so, so powerful and beneficial lifelong. And then two, just like we talked about, not even necessarily have them love the sport that they're playing. So like your five-year-old soccer, you just want them to love movement, yes. love physical activity and be engaged. And like, hey, I'm associating soccer and sport with fun and play and a coach that allows me to just have some freedom and exploration. And I'm there with my friends and I'm there with the coach that is supportive. That way I'm going to do it next year. So I think the mind shift shift has to uh, shift to um, retention and engagement and love for movement rather than just, you know, uh, number of wins and, and losses and things like that. And, you know, can I make my seven-year-old's elite team win a state championship and whatnot? So it just, yeah, like you said, you talked about the, those two, two categories. It's, it's definitely true. Yeah, that message just needs to get blasted everywhere. I mean, that's just, that's so, it's not even sport at that point. It's just everything. It's, it's movement and who we are. And it's like that gets lost real quick. (laughs) I mean, you, you're a former college athlete, myself as well. I mean, how many former uh, teammates of ours that we look at, you know, I'm middle, I'm mid thirties and I just look at it like, Jesus Christ, what happened to you in the last 10 years? Like, you know, they, they, A, they tie their identity to sport and they, they, they tie their physical activity to a sport. And then once that's over, it's like, well, what next? And again, that's my problem with LTD models is like, what's next after you're an athlete? Like we should be making sure that as coaches, that our athletes aren't, our, our identity is not tied to a sport or, you know, their physical well being and mental well being and their, their, their physical practice isn't tied to a sport rather than like you're 35 and you gained a hundred pounds since you last, last saw you as a college athlete. That's not, that's terrible. Like we got to give our athletes tools to be successful human beings far after our sport. And that involves these warmups being more exploration. So they're like, oh my God, look at these cool things I can do. That might open windows into parkour, might open windows into skateboarding, into surfing, into rock climbing, into just you know, uh, you know, physical practice out in nature, things like that. So there's to think that we just our job as, as coaches is solely to have our warm up or just all of our periods be specifically designed for them to be successful in their sport is very narrow minded. And, and, and realizing that. Again, we get out like skateboards or, you know, we uh, scooters and we get out ropes. And we, our athletes rock climb and we get out various uh, equipment and balls, even though it may not pertain to their sport. But part of it is I'm trying to open up their, their eyes and their abundance to uh, completely different skills that they may might fall in love with now. Just like, hey, I really like that. Then maybe when the sport's done and they're retired, they can do those things post, you know, uh, obviously post their, their sport participation. So. 
to think that our job as coaches ends, starts and ends with the sport that we coach. I, again, like I said, is, is very narrow minded. Yeah, man. I, I've, I've said it on this podcast before, but I have felt with some team populations, especially ones where like, like I'm working with like women swimmers and like a woman's middle distance swimmer or something, how much is improving her winner at max going to really help her swimming at some point? It's not the definitive factor in their success, but I got a lot more fulfillment hearing those swimmers oftentimes on their way out saying, I feel like I know what it means to move and be fit. Like that goes beyond swimming like just the sport. And to me, that was such a good compliment because we did things too. Like we played, we did some roughhousing, like we did, we had fun in warmups and then tried to be educational as well about like, what's a good lifting practice and what might not be so beneficial and those things as well. But I just felt like that, that was just such a hugely rewarding part about it. And we don't talk about that enough. I mean, again, transfer is awesome and finding specific training. I, I've devoted a massive part of my life to that. <laughs> and I know you oh, yeah. have too. And we all yes, have. Yeah. <laughs> We all have, but it's like, can we just break from that for a minute and look at the human part of it? And that like the warm up is like the ultimate gateway for that. We're like, we just get to be humans and forget about all the transfer for just a minute. <laughs> and yeah. I think it's Dan, John has said, I, I don't want to like destroy the quote, but something like didn't, wasn't your PR or personal best so often when you weren't thinking about everything in down to the last minutia when you were younger, and then you tried to like assemble it all crazy and really get super specific and then it just became harder. And so, uh, yeah, that plays what we need, man. Um, okay, yep. really, really quick, just because I do want to touch on it, just because I think it'll yep. offer some level of organization and buckets. And we've probably been talking about it on some level. I know you had like the three phases as well, but okay, so like youth versus say like a middle school type intermediate group versus maybe more advanced high school and college. Like what, uh, is there any um, like real strong key differences? So like these athletes come in and say, okay, this is the bucket that I really want to offer this group for their warm up. Uh, this is the bucket I want to offer this older group. What are some key principles and thoughts between these age <laughs> distinctions? Yeah. So I, like I said, starting with the youth would be uh, the majority of the time is going to be like expiration. So we are going to, you know, um, it'll be a little bit less on attunement. Like I talked about, because um, again, from an attunement standpoint, we're talking about being sensitive to specifying information for like a, a sport. And obviously we don't want that with youth athletes because they're not playing a specific sport. And then ownership, many times these kids are just maybe uh, just too novice that, you know, they don't really, um, when you give them some ownership, they may not know what to do and they just kind of freeze like a deer in headlights. So the big bucket will be exploration, giving them different challenges and obstacles, environments for them to explore and create in. So that would be, for youth, would be definitely exploration. I'm not telling them how to move. I'm not telling them what to do. Um, I'm just setting up an environment and then adjusting and manipulating that environment as I see them accomplish certain tasks or maybe struggle with a certain task, we can simplify it or, you know, like I said, make it a little more difficult or progress athletes here and there, but it's all exploration based. I want them to just move around, have fun, be creative, uh, seek for movement abundance um, over anything else. So exploration for youth athletes. As they get a little bit older uh, from middle school, high school, that uh, ownership piece will expand. So I want them to actually have some ownership and autonomy and so that, so that, that piece of the pie will expand because again, I, again, I just hate it when I see young kids that, you know, don't take any, um, ownership and they, they just don't run with it. I just think it's sad that, you know, we give athletes, all right, you have five minutes to kind of do what you want with this implement or hit, use this space or, you know, do what you need to get prepared here. And they just, like I said, it is freeze and they don't know what to do with that time because their whole life they've been, you know, told exactly what to do in every instance of their life. And so we give them a little more ownership because I want them at the end of the day, they are their own best coach They're We can't, as coaches can't be on the field holding their hands. So I, they need some ownership. Um, so that bucket will be big. The exp exploration will still be big and the tournament will, will get a little bit bigger as well. As we get into more uh, high level college athletes, et cetera. Again, when we have specific environments, again, more so if we're going towards like we're doing like a, a practice or a field session, like that attunement piece will be bigger. Um, because obviously the goal of those practices or field sessions are for athletes to in, uh, increase that relationship with the environment. And so that attunement piece will be really big. But if it's like a weight room session, so we're going to lift, like our whole warm up will be like exploration ownership based, where it's just going to be tumbling, uh, you know, various, um, various, you know, physical interactions uh, of pushing and pulling into each other, parkour, rock climbing, swinging from ropes. Um, gymnastics, it's going to be, uh, you know, some small sided games that, you know, involve maybe, you know, like a, 
like a little dodgeball or a softball where they're hitting it off a wall or off the ground, um, some competitions, things like that. So it's going to be completely just, just fun, play-based, exploration-based. Um, that would be more designed for a weight room. So yeah, there's, there's a little bit of differences there between each group there, um, depending on if they're going to the weight room versus they're going to a field, um, if they're youth versus middle school. But uh, that's kind of a, a general layout of how it might look. Right on. I uh, love that. Um, last little follow-up. Uh, I think that, do you feel like we're um, disciplined in the grind uh, that we, like we talked about earlier, like coaches or who think like that is the thing, would you personally, like you kind of replace that with ownership? Uh, would you say that's really accurate? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, uh, 100% would be that. And I think we think that we get this con- confined definition of what di- uh, discipline is. Like you can have a complete autonomy and ownership and be exploration and have, there can be discipline within that framework, right? Like, you know, people can be disciplined in, in, in play, in, in free play. They can they, they, they think that discipline strictly combines to that, that being lines and have to touch a line or stay behind a certain line or do things a, a perfect, you know, perfect way each and every time is a, is a really narrow minded, you know, definition of what discipline is. Uh, it expands to a lot more than just, um, organization, I guess you could say, and how something looks. So I, I think there's discipline within one's practice. The, uh, you went to Rafe Kelly's, you said his movement practice. There's discipline in how one approaches their exploration. There's discipline within that. So I, I think it, you know, just because we give our athletes, we want ownership and we want them to be adaptable. That that does not mean that there isn't discipline with, on their standpoint or my standpoint as a coach to that um, within that process. So um, I'm not saying that we're completely undisciplined, um, but yeah, I'd definitely say I'd replace this fake discipline, if you would, this this false discipline into athlete ownership and adaptability. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, there's the base definition of discipline, but it can just yep. go so much further than I think that we <laughs> take it. Um, I have to ask this question because it's a little devil's advocate, but like, okay, what do you yep. do? Because I know I'm thinking it. What do yep. you do with the athlete who doesn't touch the line? Because right, like that that blurs some definitions. Clearly, there's not discipline there. They didn't touch the line. They shorted it. Right? You like you, everyone's seen that little probably yeah, meme. It it's like the the person who yeah. did in and like this cost you a game, whatever it was. Right? Like, yeah. What do you think? Uh quite frankly, I don't care. Like, it's, I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. Like, so yeah, we all seen that picture of that picture, right? The guy's lines like six inches short of the uh, mm-hmm. of the line, and they this is the difference between winning and losing. And I just can't tell them like, no, it's not like, it, it's not the difference between winning and losing that the guy, the fact that that guy missed the line has no bearing effect of whether a team won or lost a game. I think that's just uh, crazy to me. Um, uh, obviously we want guys to hit the line. I, I just, you know, I just, I, I, I just, I'm not going to get worked up over it. Yeah. Um, we might play it out and like, Hey, you, you know, you missed the line here, but I'm not going to discipline a guy or yell at, you know, necessarily yell at a guy, but I just, I think it just doesn't matter. And then again, if you building, if you're building tasks and environments, um, where, where missing something like that is important, like it will rear its, its head rather than just like a warm up where you have to touch a line or a condition where you have to touch a line where it has no bearing on anything. So like, a, like I said, if we're playing some sort of small side game and a guy stepped out of bounds, well, guess what? That's the rule. You're out of bounds. Mm-hmm. That's where the ball needs to be placed. So there, there's different consequences based on, um, how you design and set up environments. And so. If it's like a conditioning type thing or a warm type thing and a guy does touch a line, I really could care less. Um, I just, I don't think that has any bearing of effect uh, of, of outcome in a, in a, in a game. Um, so that would be how I approach it. But again, if a guy is playing a, a game, he steps out of bounds. Well, that's just the rule of the game. Mm-hmm. That's, you, you, you know, that's just a consequence of how I design the rule of this task or environment. So there, there's an outcome for that. And rather than a guy doesn't touch a line during conditioning, we're going to make up some sort of outcome and then take a picture of it and post it on mm-hmm. social media for other coaches to like, even though, you know, it has no bearing on effect with that athlete. And so here's the deal. Like, I don't know, Joe, maybe you haven't, but I've had, I've, I've missed lines during conditioning. I've had, I've been over a line, you know, if we start a warm up, everyone's supposed to be behind the line. I've been over it again. That had no bearing effect on my focus, my attention and my discipline within the context of my game. Like you to think that that somehow, because an athlete doesn't touch a line during conditioning means they're an undisciplined, unfocused athlete when they play their sport, I think is a huge stretch yeah. um, of our imagination. So that's just how I look at it. Yeah. I just, I think it's something that's, that is different. Like those athletes who don't touch the line, I think there's an, there's an ego piece to that where they don't see the value for their own self. 
And so, yeah. but when it's a game, they do see the value for themselves because they got people watching and oh, my credibility and I, and I need to play well, like it's a different metal. So, I mean, there, there might be some implications of that. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not yeah. versed to that, but I definitely absolutely see the difference that ha- I've seen plenty of athletes who under my watch, I had to, I was getting, you know, getting on them, get to the line. If you don't, I'm going to, but again, I did that because it was my job, but I also, and I, I don't know, I feel like for my, the context of the job and what I was being asked to do, that was important. However, I don't, I can't say how much I think that helped them play better because it is a totally different place. Like, so I understand that a hundred percent. I, yeah, just think and the, the, the piece of, I think the biggest thing would be yeah, accountability, obviously, to your teammates. That's the yeah. biggest thing where if you're doing this, uh, if everyone else is doing it correctly and you're not, like, there's an accountability piece, but from a piece like that picture that we're talking about where it says this is the difference between winning and losing, I will not agree with. Now, from an mm-hmm. accountability piece, from like your teammates, uh, you're not, doing some of the things and because you, you so you're not accountable to the rest of your team that's a different uh you know discussion in itself but um i think you know really it comes down to um if those things are being an issue i think it's poorly designed activities would be my my argument like i'm not going to do mm-hmm. r- rote conditioning to touch a line and back because i don't think that's important i don't think it's going to dictate the scoreboard and for an athlete nor do i think you know an athlete being two inches short is going to make a difference um in that conditioning drill or in the outcome of the game so I would just never do those things. So I, I don't hmm. think I'd ever leave myself up to um, being, uh, having an athlete do those things in my watch because I just, I'm not going to put myself in that situation where those environments where we have to touch a line because I'm just making up some sort of standard that we have to touch a line because it's what we do. It's, our, it's, it's discipline. I would just never put myself in that situation where those are things I designed. And so I just never find myself being a counter, you know, interacting with those scenarios because it just doesn't happen. Um, it for how i design things sure yeah I, what i what i sense from it is like if that athlete who doesn't touch the line was mentally quitting in a game specific practice where a technical now that's maybe something that's more like okay like th- it's it's just different based off of it, there's different in, insinuations yeah. based off of what the task at hand is and joel reinhardt when a- him and andrew cormier was on to talk about just taking the noise out like do we even need to do conditioning if it's all in the game and it's all game specific or games perception reaction like why should we be doing you know we know these player loads why do we need to do extra running you know and then just doing some 10 meter flies which are obviously engaging it's not like athletes are going to be like you know unless they just have total like you know i I would imagine in that situation all those athletes would be fairly into that you know it's timed it's everyone else is watching whatever but um yeah i just i feel like if you were in situations with minimal noise that that conditioning test might not even exist anyway so yeah right yep yep Anyways, I'm sure we could talk about this forever. It really, really <laughs> oh, yeah. interesting topics, very deeply, like lots of factors that go into all this stuff, but I love oh, yeah. it. Lots of, it's a little bit messy sometimes, but it's, uh, it's yep. really good stuff to talk about, Michael. I really appreciate it. Man, we only got through two, three, but the questions, <laughs> those are the best. I, I made like eight for you. I'll have to, maybe yeah. some other time I'll have to talk about the rest of them, but I appreciate you coming on, man. I, I know I've kept you a while and uh, thank you for your time and spending time talking today. Yes, Joel, it's great to catch up after almost two years, man. And uh, I think it was pre-pandemic before uh, last time we spoke. And so now you're you're up Midwest. My daughter's almost two. You're coaching a five-year-old soccer team. So things have changed since last time we talked. Yeah, yeah, a lot has changed. I Man, I've, it's flown by. So I, I didn't realize it was two years. But yeah, it's, it was great to catch up again, man. I hopefully it won't be too long till we t- uh, chat again. Yep. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for tuning into the show. We'll see you guys next week with another great guest.